Okay, so um, hello everyone. Hello. Welcome to our second um, lecture in planning series for this term. And uh, today we have Professor Emma Mousley, the Professor of Geography from University of Cambridge. So uh, Professor Emma Mousley's car uh, recent research has focused on global development politics with a particular interest in South-South cooperation, India and the UK. Current work includes editing a special section for international affairs, Chapman House on India, China, and the Turkey's claim on being civilizational states. And a substantial research project with colleagues looking at the role of private sector consultants and the contractors in development. Professor Mousley is the director of Morgan Astin Center for Global Studies and at Norman College at University of Cambridge. And for today's talk, um, South-South cooperation has transformed the global development imaginaries, practices, and institutions over the last 20 years or so. At the same time, the long-standing principles and the framing of South-South cooperation, anti-hegemonic solidarity, no interference, shared identities, have come under significant pressure and shifted in new and explicitly like um, Except nationalist direction in many cases. This lecture will first elaborate on the recent evolution, evolution of this dynamic landscape of development cooperation and draw out the current trends and the directions. Professor Mousley will then explore these themes, especially in relation to research and the scholarship around urban partnerships, including the creation of master plans urban infrastructure norms and projects, and the planning and the regulatory technical assistance. The lecture will conclude by asking what are urban lands offers in developing South-South cooperation today? So please join me welcoming Professor Emma Mouse. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask if you can hear me okay? Yes. Great, well, yeah. look, what's honor it is to be um, giving a seminar. Um, I'm really delighted. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, let's see how this goes. Can you now see, if I click it to slideshow, hopefully. Yes. Okay, I think I can see that. Is that okay? Everyone can see it? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you again. Um, so a few uh, explanations. Um, I'm speaking from home. I have one small dog who's climbed onto my lap and another one on the sofa. So if you hear any barking, I apologize. I'll try and get them quiet quickly. Um, many thanks to all of my hosts and uh, uh, Kasha and everyone who invited me. Um, I am not an expert in urban geographies, urban planning. Um, I'm really looking forward very much to hearing your expertise. But I thought um, if we think about, uh, let me see if I can move this slide on. Yes, uh, so the aims today are really a preliminary exploration of some of the interesting intersections between scholarship on South-South development cooperation, and I'm looking here at the formal world, which I'll explain in a moment. And I've said the urban geographies of the global South. Um, I know that these are very problematic terms, and I'm thinking around the full spectrum of planning, policies, programs, and so on, uh, lives and livelihoods. Um, so it's a conversation. Um, it's the first time I've given this presentation and I've been thinking about it for a little while, but it is really very preliminary and I hope that you find it interesting. So some caveats to start off with. I'm not looking at some of the amazing, very productive and interesting uh, crossovers from South to South by civil society. So a classic example would be slum Shack Dwellers International. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can see someone coming to the front. Is that all right? Okay, great. 
So um, I'm really looking at the, the more formal realm of state-led development cooperation. It would be a very different talk if I was looking at some of the more informal civil society transnational networks. And I'm going to use the language of North, South, South, South. This is very problematic. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me the, the shortcut that I'm using here, but I'm very aware of the problematic dimensions of this language. So um, what I'm going to do first is um, provide a development overview and a brief introduction to South South. I'm very aware that I can't read the room, that you may be experts on South South cooperation. So I've made it, I hope, sufficiently short not to bore the experts and sufficiently detailed to, sorry, there goes the dog, <laughs> sufficiently detailed that if anyone isn't familiar with it, you get a taste of what South South is. And then I've really drawn out four areas that I think are emerged for me as I started to think about this question. I, I, I read a lot about urban theory in the South, but I'm not an expert. I read it as it comes along. But this was the first time I started thinking about this intersection. So four kind of areas that uh, occurred to me and then some scholarly connections and disconnections. So let me start with a very quick um, introduction to kind of the uh, context for this uh, world of what Diane, uh, uh, Gillian Hart calls big D development, the formal intentional effort to intervene in uh, a region, a country, a community, and to uh, unleash whatever we mean by development. So she produced this very famous schematic, which located global development, mainly Western led, in both a large scale political economy uh, of things like the Bretton Woods regime and then the Dollar Wall Street regime, the geopolitics of the Cold War, and then specific uh, dominant development theories from the state led developmentalism under both socialism and capitalism somewhat mediated by things like basic needs and the emergence of environmental concerns and feminist concerns. And then the shift in the 1980s to the neoliberal counter-revolution uh, moving forward to the post-Washington consensus. So this is a schematic, it doesn't say at all, but it's quite useful way of thinking about the big contextualization. So a few years ago, I started to think, well, what does this schematic miss off? And it is of course a very Eurocentric schematic in some ways because the driver is from the west from the north if on the other hand we annotate it with south south uh, development cooperation which was going on all of this time we can think about key markers and milestones like the bandung conference the creation of the non-aligned movement in the 1970s the demand for a new international economic order very interestingly i just heard today that there is a social movement that is trying to relaunch the, the new international economic order. Very interesting. So my earlier work was involved in sort of recapturing a history of development uh, from the South, which was interestingly not just neglected by rather say mainstream figures and scholars, but also by radical writers and thinkers, uh, by critical development geographers and others uh, that I too had been guilty of teaching a rather Eurocentric um, and researching a rather Eurocentric understanding of development, but all of this was going on. So then we get to the question of what's going on now. And this I think is where it gets so interesting, the last sort of 15, 20 years or so. And here we see much more turbulence and melding between across and within northern and southern actors in development. So both geostrategic collaboration and competition, I think very interesting is the concerns about the right turn up to the new Cold War, uh, a new phase of neoliberalism, the Wall Street consensus, the centrality of financialization, and that intersects with things like industrial policy, the infrastructural turn, the uh, growth of public-private hybrid finance uh, and uh, mapped under the SDGs. So 
what then about the urban? Uh, so of course the urban makes its way through all of this. And that's the question I've asked myself today. Before doing so, I'm going to say a little bit about South-South Cooperation. And um, I do hope that uh, for, for some of you, this is interesting and novel. I'm sure that for many of you, it's, it's very familiar. So very broadly speaking, South-South Cooperation should not be mistaken for foreign aid. It is not a synonym of foreign aid. And some of the mistakes that were made in poorly attributing motives and agendas and outcomes to Southern partners came around because there was an assumption by many commentators in the early 2000s that South-South Cooperation was just aid done by Southern countries. It does include many of the same things that we would recognize by under the OECD DAX uh, definition of aid. And it, there's, it also goes beyond that in many ways. So South-South Corporation can include various forms of loans, grants, debt relief, and other forms of um, export credit and other forms of financial assistance and flows. It can include technical assistance, educational scholarship and training, things that also, of course, come under ODA, uh, under, under the Western Foreign Aid definition. Sponsored public and private sector delegations, meetings, knowledge transfer, uh, turnkey projects, infrastructure, status buildings. It can also include diplomatic gestures, military cooperation, humanitarianism, humanitarianism and so on. So it's a very, very broad basket. And critically, it actively and explicitly and um, very determinedly overlaps. It blurs and blends with trade, with economic flows, with diplomatic agendas and so on. And it makes no excuse for that and nor should it. Um, so, uh, so South South Corporation is, uh, some bits of it are more definable than others and other times it bleeds out into, you know, when is it trade? When is it private sector investment? When is it South South Corporation? And that becomes a very difficult question to answer. So uh, the origins are very important. Um, and broadly, some of the key origins of this were third world solidarity. And I use third world deliberately here in the following Vijay Prashad uh, in his brilliant book, A History of the Darker Nations, when he reminds us that in the 1950s and 60s, the third world was a, a kind of a, a terminology of hope, of optimism, the third world spirit wants, you know, would prevail. So solidarity in the third world, of course, uh, key moments were Bandung, which we see here in the picture on the left, uh, various forms of socialism. Uh, so not just Russian socialism, Chinese socialism and others, Cuban and others. Um, and uh, this is a great, I'm sure many of you have seen this, one of the many propaganda posters of the time. Uh, and isn't it different from the sort of typical, say, British attitude to or French attitude to former colonial um, possessions, the holding hands, the conviviality, the warmth, the smiles, and of course this was uh, all signalling a very different construct of the relationships between countries than the imperial and neo-imperial ones. And then for different regions there were also Gulf politics and OPEC uh, also was a major driver of Gulf um, uh, donorship. That every country had its own variations, of course, uh, Indian uh, cooperation with Nepal, which uh, started in the early 1950s. India helped build the East-West Highway and Nepal's first airport, and that was also ge geostrategic, uh, and that was about Nepal's hydro resources, but also looking north to China. So every country has its own uh, variation. Uh, most South-South cooperation was small, even though it's symbolically important, but there were some big outliers. One of the examples is the Desara Railway, which was um, an extraordinary feat of uh, willpower and engineering, and it was a profoundly anti-colonial gesture uh, to help free up Zambia from the stranglehold that at the time uh, the country called Rhodesia had over, over its copper. So it's a brilliant gesture of, of anti 
uh, colonialism, but it was also a demonstration of, Ma of Maoist China's engineering prowess. Uh, everyone said it couldn't be done and they did it. Um, at the time, this was the, the reality of course is, is always a bit more strategic, pragmatic, there's a lot going on, but the framing was not the same as, we, uh, as that of the Western donors. The framing, which has continued for a very long time, although I'm going to say it has changed a bit, was not of charity to the poor, but of the opportunity of working with Senegal, Mongolia, Yemen, Costa Rica, wherever. So instead of moral obligation, these were countries that had shared the experience of colonialism, shared the experience of subjugation, and they were acting not out of a sort of charitable sense of, oh, well, we must help this poor country, but rather of the solidarity um, of, of a shared experience. Expertise was based on the very direct experience of pursuing development in poor country circumstances. So, for example, I spoke uh, with a great man in the Indian Postal Service, um, Dak Bhavan, who was leading a project in three East African countries on how to deliver mail to uh, resource poor settings, uh, to informal settlements, to places that were hit by the monsoon. Uh, and, and, and his point was that India knew how to do that in a way that, say, Germany didn't. So it's not sympathy, but empathy. And um, as I've written about at, 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 uh, at length, um, the virtue here is not of aid, of giving to from the rich to the poor, because the argument is that that is always humiliating. Instead, the, of, there is the virtue of the idea, not of gifting, but of exchange, that this is, you both get something, Egypt and India get, solidar get, get the benefits of solidarity. So even if India is giving to Nepal, both countries are made stronger by building up relations between poor countries. So the, the virtue then is dignity. The virtue is, the, is reciprocity. It's not inferior aid to talk about a win-win situation. So um, there's, a, there's a long, long, long varied history, but that is very broadly one of the, you know, the kind of some of the origins and um, decades that followed. Around the 2000s, we see uh, a real sea change in SASAF Corporation. We see, a, and, and I've put this in a, another paper as um, we can track it materially, ontologically, ideationally. So I'll just say a little bit about each one of those. By material, um, I could choose absolutely any, any dodgy image on Google images that I, I liked. Um, we have to be a little bit cautious about these figures because it depends what they're measuring and how. And like I said at the start, South-South is not always capturable. So if we, if we try not to see these necessarily as an absolutely <laughs> accurate set of figures, but instead as indicative, almost anything will show up this huge increase. This is like a six-fold increase, uh, no, sorry, three-fold increase, nearly more than that, in, very, in this case, in, um, I think it's uh, the BRICS, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and they're spending, uh, they, notice they call it aid, which I think is problematic. So um, the first is that the material capacities in the form of finances, uh, educational scholarships, you, you name it, it starts to really rise for a lot of donors. And we can think about China, Brazil, India in particular, as really suddenly their booming economies, uh, you know, as the kind of new bricks um, start to expand their material capacities to uh, spend and to drive their South-South cooperation programs. The second I called ontological, and I'm, I'm thinking here of things like, you know, the idea of uh, the psychological concept of ontological security. So until the early 2000s, even though there had been a huge amount of activity, a real different history of development cooperation from the South, they were just sort of, um, invisibilized. And like I said, I mean, there were, of course, brilliant exceptions, people who for decades had been writing about China's role in Africa, about uh, Taiwan's uh, rice projects in the Gambia. You know, lots of people had been writing about them, 
but I don't think they were particularly visible to many critical and mainstream scholars and policy commentators and so on. By the time you get to the early 2000s, very strongly driven by the economic shift to Asia by the, the power of the BRICS, these countries suddenly become both visible, but also interestingly essential. So a key moment comes in 2011 at the um, fourth uh, conference on aid effectiveness in Busan, in Korea. And a number of countries said they weren't going to turn up, in particular China, at which point, I mean, normally the, the, the recipient countries never came. They, it was just the donor countries who sat together, made policy and told everyone how it was going to be. Now, not only were the recipient and southern donor countries, as it were, development assistance provider countries invited, but if China didn't come, everybody knew the conference was pointless. Um, and in fact, the British Minister for Development went to Beijing the night before, I've, I've heard the rumour, and got on his knees and basically begged China to send somebody. So that sort of, the, the, the southern, particularly the larger southern providers, suddenly went, they didn't just became visible, they became essential, they became credible, they became recognised as uh, key parts of the development ecology. The last one of this, of this three, this change around the early 2000s is ideationally. That is that when the larger Southern providers in particular started to expand, they, the, the, the mainstream organizations like the DAC and the UN basically thought their job was to show them how to become proper donors. They would bring them in to the tent and the southern partners resisted and they said no we do things differently to you our donors our, our development assistance and relationships comes from a different ethic a different history a different positioning and if we think about the, the history of development as many people have unpacked it is a deeply colonial history and at this point even you know, with Mexico, uh, Chile, um, certainly the big providers, in but Indonesia, they all said, no, we, we are continuing to do it our way. And as a sort of a little, sometimes, you know, the, the most boring details, uh, the most kind of administrative details, if you like, are, are found. This is the Busan outcome document. And the bit in bold was at the insistence of the Southern providers who said that their principles, commitments and actions shall be a reference for South South partners on a voluntary basis. Now, the, the big powers, the Americas, the Germanys, the UKs, were trying to push them to accept uh, an agreed set of principles and commitments and actions. And the ideational autonomy and leadership, indeed, of the Southern providers is demonstrated here in that they could refuse this multilateral pressure. Are you all hearing me okay? Am I speaking too fast? Is it comprehensible? You, it, this is okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, do please, I, I tend to get faster as I get more Excited, so please slow me down if I'm speaking too fast. So just to sort of say a few more words then about South-South cooperation in the current period, I would say that what has happened is that the South has been the ideational leader. And for various reasons, we actually now see amongst the so-called mainstream, so-called traditional donors, the UK, the Netherlands, Norway, Canada, and all the rest, a shift much more towards the South in how they approach development. In fact, so they look, look more like Korea, Japan, China, India. So we see a move from foreign aid to blended finance, much more public, private and hybrid. Poverty reduction, the poverty reduction of the Millennium Development Goals has been swallowed up it's been shifted away from being the central purpose of development. 
and economic growth has returned as the central goal of the development industry. And the assumption is that poverty reduction then follows. We've seen the infrastructural turn. And we now have the Netherlands and uh, New Zealand talking about win-win. So the growing respectability of having explicit national interest. Of course, aid has always worked in the national interest for Western donors. But the performance of aid, particularly around the late 1990s, the Millennium Development Goals, was of doing good, being good, doing good. Now it's much more likely that the that whether you're Australia, you know, uh, even kind of the very uh, you know Sweden will talk much more about its explicit national interests. And as I mentioned, with the financialization turn, um, we see a very important turn away from the idea of aid, foreign aid, as a particular, distinctive, somewhat independent flow of financing for development in its own little moral sphere. And instead, all of the turn now is towards the idea of state-owned enterprises, private sector, public-private partnerships, blended finance, and so on. So we see a much, much, much bigger role for various forms of blended public-private finance. And this is quite a big deal, but we don't have time to go into it. But it's mimicking the South. It's basically now the UK looks more like China in this regard than China looks like the UK. China hasn't hived off its aid. The UK has moved more towards a China model. And so just very briefly, the narrative has changed um, amongst all development partners. There's more discussion about the opportunity of development of partnerships rather than donor recipients and uh, of different forms of expertise, but which is compatible, collaboration, win-win and mutual benefits. So, you know, I think uh, the, the DAC donors have moved closer to the, the discursive framing of Southern partners. Um, and I've been talking here about DAC donors and uh, bilateral partners, but the UN is a very interesting site as well in the way in which it's long-standing apparatus around South-South cooperation. The UN has been supporting it distinctly since the 1970s, but it's grown, it's solidified, it's moved up the UN hierarchy and it's been funded better. So I did find this quote, and this is for all of you urban <laughs> planners and urban uh, theorists at last, here's something urban. Um, and I'll just let you read that for a second about uh, a, a relatively recent memorandum driven very strongly by COVID uh, around how the UN wants to support a new urban agenda in relation to South South. Okay, so I'm going to go on very quickly. I've got a couple more things to say about South South today and then move on to the intersection with the urban. So in 2022, 23 we are now, um, where are we at? So I think a number of Southern partners are experiencing uh, both the fruits of success, but also challenges. There has been a slowdown in global growth and the COVID pandemic has impacted uh, on, on some we see in Brazil for both domestic and uh, economic, uh, global economic reasons, a real contraction, for example. The massive increase in financing in projects, programs and other things has often outstripped the uh, institutional and legal anchoring. And it, it, there's been some poor decision making around financing dams and so on. So there hasn't the, the institutional fabric hasn't often kept up with the expansion in resources. Greater visibility, um, you know, in the last 20 years, China is all over the news everywhere, including in terms of development. Well, that brings visibility at home and it certainly brings visibility abroad. So here we see a protest uh, the, against uh, pro-Savannah, 
in Mozambique against a Brazilian Japanese uh, triangular cooperation program, and also Ethiopian and Indian land activists who came together to protest against um, uh, some de development partnership between the governments of Ethiopia and India. And simply the inherent challenges of development um, have become more apparent. So some of the early optimism that the Southern partners, they knew how to do it, they could get it done. They had the, the sort of the knowledge, the expertise, the, the jugard, to use the Indian term. Actually, it turns out it's, it's harder than you think. Um, and very positively in many ways, uh, depending a little bit, is that countries like Rwanda, countries um, like Laos, have become more uh, adapted and better at managing this marketplace of donors and development partners. That has consequences for, for the uh, agenda setting of the big seven partners. Um, what we, I would have argued is that we are seeing is a move away from some of the Bandung principles, which were always a framing. It wasn't like every country was acting entirely through Bandung principles, but there's a move away even from the language of Bandung. It's not going to disappear, but towards this increasingly nationalistic and pragmatic way. So if we take just the example of Indonesia, uh, Boisjoli argues that it's being increasingly framed in terms of the direct benefits it can bring, oops, sorry, to Indonesia. And this is pre-Trump, um, that South-South Cooperation follows an Indonesia first policy designed to complement domestic development policies and projects that are increasingly scrutinized on a what's in it for us basis. This is quite different to that earlier origin language of third worldist solidarity where you were thinking about the exchange and the mutual benefit, but the language was more elevated and idealistic. We see a move a, to, away from the sort of uh, un, lack of conditions. You have this money, you tell us what to do with it. You know, let's pile in and build these roads and dams towards a much more slightly scarred and careful approach to recognizing that these projects can fail, that they can be poor debt, uh, that they can be problematic. And so this is um, from Barnaby Dye, who talks about the fact that India has moved from celebrating its non-conditionality to quietly having a more interventionist, stringent, conditions-laden export credit process. So still not micromanaging, but becoming more interested in these investments and in getting its re return on investment. So today I think we see powerful Southern partners sharing in leading edge neoliberal innovations. China, India, others are absolutely at the front end of hybrid capital, enclaved development, financialization, including in urbanization and transport. I haven't talked about this, but I would say that we're seeing a very concerning closing down, for the most part, of civil society voice, space and action, or attempts anyway. I think we're seeing a, a, a remarkable um, flourishing of new geographies of power and knowledge, which I'm going to come to in the urban, um, around what is a very rapidly changing definition and relationship between this idea of big D and little d development. And I should stop there and, and just, I, I'm, many of you will know this, but the big D, little d development is a device for thinking through big D, you know, the World Bank, Oxfam, uh, DFID, as was, um, the, the, those, in, those deliberate interventions. And little d as the dynamic background, imminent, world and processes of the economy of capitalist relations. Um, and of course they intersect. And I would say they're collapsing in on each other now. There's, there's sort of less defined big D. It's also fascinating, just fascinating to see the return of the dinosaurs, the reinvigoration. We, we're, I, you know, when I've been teaching for 20, 25 years on development, and things like modernization theory, dependency debates started to get squeezed into smaller and smaller space at the start of the lecture course so that I could teach about post-development and 
Escobar and the SDGs. And all of a sudden we're back. We're back to talking about China reviving modernization, uh, Asian modernization. We're back to being concerned about dependency, structural transformation or underdevelopment, but this time China in the, in the driving seat and so on. So, um, and all of this I've given the shortest and most generalized um, analysis, and many of you will be experts in your own areas and fields, and I appreciate that you're very aware that uh, all of this is, is much more diverse than I have suggested here. So on to the urban. Um, as I said, I'm not um, an urban expert. Um, uh, I, I'm an interested amateur, I would say. So in the last few weeks, I have added to my urban reading by specifically trying to read into what I see in the urban literatures, um, of which, of course, I've only know a fraction, and where it intersects with South-South Corporation, bearing in mind that South-South Corporation can mean more or less everything. The, 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 there's a core that's very clearly South-South Corporation, but it as, it, as you move further and further away into trade, private investment, uh, migration of people, uh, exchanges of knowledge, it's, it, you can't always put a clear boundary around it. So I've tried to identify some key features. So one is knowledge, technical expertise, assistance, training of all sorts. And if you remember here, the, the claim in South-South Corporation is that partner countries are have specific expertise. So Brazil could go to Mozambique and say, we successfully transformed the Cerrado or Cerrado region. We can show you how to transform this agricultural region. And it's grounded in empathy, similar trajectories. It's very important to say that South South is often the principle is that the recipient decides on their priorities and what they want. And that Southern partners are more likely to be able to provide speed and utility. And in the urban context, there are absolutely brilliant papers looking at the master plans. We can think of Vanessa Watson and the nightmares or dreams, Southern consultancies. Singapore produces many technical reports, the training up of civil engineers and planners, the impact in uh, of architecture and design, civil engineering and so on. But there's also urban policies and programs. So things like um, the uh, Brazil leading uh, slum policy in Haiti and using Brazilian security techniques in Haitian slums, very controversially. Um, perhaps a bit more, more positively, Brazil leading out Bolsa Familia uh, in around the world, um, in including in urban populations. We can think about Cuban doctors in Brazilian favelas or participatory budgeting in Maputo led by China, or uh, I'm trying to remember who the partner was in that case. I think Brazil again. Um, I'm going to expand on all of these, but basically one dimension of South-South cooperation and how it intersects with the urban is all around knowledge exchange and the provision of different, very, very different forms of knowledge in construction, in uh, planning, in programs. So, um, we could choose so many different things. I mean, I've, this is a bit provocative in a way because uh, Colombo in Angola is an exceptionally uh, controversial um, uh, example of a Chinese uh, ghost city um, with lots of fascinating explorations of why and how this came about. A more positive example comes from Gabriela Carolini's work in Maputo. And she, um, one reason I like this paper very much is that she really talks about the extraordinary richness and the groundedness of understanding. In this case, I think it's Brazilian and other forms of South-South cooperation in place. That these are not abstract processes. They come through particular offices, people, moments. And I like her opening thing that the novelty or distinctness of South-South cooperation as a development paradigm is contestable, which I'll come back to, its relevance for urban planning is not. So she talks about thick cooperation and flexibility in implementation. The real value of SSC for urban development is the cultivation of shared power and sense of ownership. 
very different from, let's say, the World Bank um, and some of their urban policies. So knowledge production or expertise is shared and can encourage an iterative, iterative reform process and adaptive flexibility that leads to a deepening of improvements and democratic change. This finding deserves more attention. Um, so who city authorities learn from or cooperate with matters. So um, I'll keep going. Um, just one last example from within this sort of knowledge and people and programs exchange from a paper by uh, Lidola and I'm going to say this right, wrongly, but uh, Borges, um, on uh, Cuban doctors coming to uh, work in Brazilian uh, low income settlements and favelas. Now, if you'll notice uh, the picture on the right shows a Cuban doctor or healthcare professional um, looks, she looks like she's uh, strapping a broken arm. Um, we'll come back to that later because we'll say something about racialization. Okay, so the second one is finance, how this intersects with finance. And as I've mentioned, this blurred and blended, it's meant to be recipient led and often less conditionality laden than say World Bank or you know, certainly IMF or other donors. So here we see a huge, again, a kind of a boom in available finance for urban development, but for, for cities, for malls, you name it, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, and, it's, and it's provided a marketplace of finance that has really powerfully disrupted the, the West's stranglehold on development finance and on some of the conditionalities that go with that. Construction, um, the South South claim is that it's cheaper, it's knowledgeable and it's faster amongst many other things. We see uh, various firms, state champions, uh, state owned enterprises, uh, controversially labor. Do you bring over Chinese labor, for example, to build Kilamba and others or not? Whole cities are being built. There are, there are apparently about 70 cities are currently being built. We can see there's Yache, Knowledge City in Ecuador being built by Korea. Uh, Japan is providing models for cities, but also districts, malls, and then importantly, not just sort of housing, but also industrial units and SEZs. And I'll come back to this later. There is an industrial urban complex at work here. And then Needless to say, the very famously, the transport, the roads, energy infrastructure, including in the in the city region, the dams and so on. A different sort of construction is humanitarian. So um, one of the things that India is very proud of is the housing it rebuilt after the tsunami in Sri Lanka. And one of the arguments was that the Indians were much, much better at designing tropical houses for Sri Lankan communities. And there is a ghastly example of a German uh, housing initiative against which they compared themselves, where the Germans, a very well-meaning German uh, lander, literally said that they wanted to create particular settlements from, from scratch in the, in, the, in the areas destroyed by the tsunami, that by the shape and nature of the housing and the settlement would create good German burghers that what was lacking in Sri Lankans was uh, civic pride and consciousness and that by creating these houses, they would do that. And needless to say, the, that didn't go down very well. But India could say, no, we, we know what we're doing here. We've, we've done it. Um, and I've just put economies, um, but bearing, so, so one of the strong claims is that the, the, the rise of the South, as it's been called, that um, there has been a, a rising tide for, for many Southern countries driven by the larger powers, but with benefits to all. Uh, and we see this in terms of more formal economies, but also, as I'll come to in a moment, smaller scale, small and medium enterprises, individuals, and formal, informal and hybrid. Other parts of the uh, uh, urban development planning policy programs literature, not so much is uh, if, well, there's lots in the urban literature, not very much in the Southern literature, is around things like cultures, aesthetics, and consumption. So there's a wonderful, rich literature in the urban, various urban uh, journals, 
and subfields. And the South-South South Cooperation literature doesn't do this so much to think about the many, many ways, in fact, the, the multiculturalism of um, Kibera or the favela or the uh, elite housing and, and people living and the going to the malls and so on. And not just cultures, aesthetics and consumption, but also the convivialities uh, and the divides. So um, again, there is some work in South-South Corporation. Um, I um, have always really loved the work of Katia Taila, who looked at how the conviviality, the friendships, the romance, the differences between Brazilian and Mozambican development workers who are working together in Mozambique. But we also see in, in the urban literature a much closer attention to things like racism, friendship, sex work, gated and enclaved homes and workplaces and camps. And it's really not very strongly present in the South-South literature. And yet, I think this is where a, an enormous amount of the energy and importance of the South, South resides. Okay, I think I better hurry up, right? So um, very, very quickly, uh, a third year undergraduate of mine is looking at Chinese and United States and Taiwan's engagement with Somaliland. And she did this nice bit of visual representation this is the way the United States newspapers depict Somaliland, kind of rather chaotic scenes, urban scenes, poor people, and for oddly Mo Farah, uh, a British athlete. Um, China, on the other hand, its journalistic pictures are show a very different urban aesthetic, a very different concern with how to present Somaliland, as well as you know a kind of more uh, the, the sheep and the the fair. Fascinatingly, and I just thought I'd throw this in, Taiwan is all about flags, 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 all about the presenting statehood. So Taiwan and Somaliland both have an interest in projecting their legitimacy and credibility as states. But I think really what I wanted to show you was the urban, the difference in how the US presents and represents urbanization, the urban in Somaliland, and how the Chinese do it. Um, this is an urban, but if you haven't come across it already, there is a brilliant set of essays on China's representations of Africa through the film, through a set of essays on the film Wolf Warrior. It's really fascinating. And I think it shows you what we could be doing if we were working uh, at some of these um, more interesting understandings of South South um, in, in, in the cultural realm. All right, so the last few slides. Um, the other one to talk about is what are the implications of South South cooperation, South South relations and partnerships for governance, um, civil society, citizenship, and surveillance. And I realize I have not added in Mosa there, who is in the bibliography at the end of this who's written a remarkable paper on something called Forest City, which is Malaysian owned, but has been sort of gifted to China practically. Who, China is building an enormous city in the straits between Malaysia and Singapore. And one of the most fascinating things about it is its governance. Apparently, it, I mean, it is not really subject to Malaysian law, but it's not quite Chinese. Uh, sovereign territory either. And the argument is that the, 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 the law will be run by a private security firm. So we, we're yet to see how this will actually work out. But there are fascinating questions for the implications of, say, urban partnerships. China's sponsor, sponsoring something like 124 uh, urban partnerships in Africa with working with mayors and governments. So what are the implications then for civil society, for surveillance? Uh, for citizenship and so on. These are open questions. I'm not trying to say judge them to be better or worse or good or bad, but these are really important questions to come together, I think, in the urban and South-South. Might we say then that South-South is helping decolonize uh, urban planning development programs? I think the jury is not strong on this. The, on the one hand, there is unquestionably a real fracturing of Northern-led 
development hegemony. And that's very welcome. Is there what post decolonial scholars have called epistemic disobedience? Most authors engage with it in more nuanced ways. Is this something that one could describe as Asian modernity or planning uh, or are, is it that a host of other players, Turkey, Kuwait, Korea, China, and others are sort of moving in Dubai into the realm, but fundamentally inhabiting the same modernist logics. So I think the, there's lots to ask ourselves about decoloniality. Um, and then this is the penultimate slide. Unquestionably, the urban is being drawn into geoeconomics and geopolitics. Um, and we see this through things like financing and infrastructure and the new Cold War. So the launch of the European Union's global gateways is, is an open challenge to the Belt and Road industry, uh, Belt and Road, um, what's it called? Um, that I, I realize I put more X's instead of authors. Um, there's some a new papers emerging on the urban in the Belt and Road, which are really interesting. And we see um, unquestionably some of this new city development in particular, the master plans, the big urban imaginaries and futuristic ideas are projections of soft power. And the, the link with to the geoeconomic is this state capital hybridity and state entrepreneurialism in building ties to create uh, things like global production networks and so on. To conclude then, I've absolutely rattled through um, uh, a quick history of South South Corporation and then just raised lots of questions about these literatures. What has struck me about reading these literatures, thinking and asking myself specifically, where is South South Corporation? Is that there are some really great people writing about it. Gabriella Carolini, uh, certainly people who are specifically asking, how is South South driving these urban processes? How is it being resisted? What are the implications? But I've been very surprised at the disconnect between my sort of scholarly world and the urban theory planning policies world. And I think this is a failing of my literature, my, uh, my, my thing. I think the urban work is actually much more generative, much more interesting, much more attentive to some of the vibrancy of uh, ordinary lives in ordinary cities, as it were, taking off in much more multifaceted, multicultural ways with new peoples, um, sometimes filled with friction. Whereas the South-South literature to me still seems a little bit inattentive to the urban, to the everyday, to the small d development. And I think um, the, the more conversations we have, uh, the better, um, particularly for uh, my field of work. Um, and I have um, most of the references there that I have um, offered. Uh, let me stop sharing if I can. Okay, um, thank you very much for the lecture. And um, now we will open the floor for discussion. So for those who are participating by Zoom, you can post your questions uh, by chat. And at the meantime, we will also accept questions from people who are attending here. Are there any questions? So um, I can start by one question I have, and I think that's responding to the conclusion you are driving about the urban study and the development studies. And you mentioned that perhaps this, this need for small d development in like um, South South Cooperation Studies literature. But like my thinking is that you mentioned this new emergence of state-led development. And uh, my question would be um, to build a dialogue between those two fields. Do you think it, there's a need to also for the urban study scholars to rethink about the state-led development? Because this is such like a, um, 
big driver now and uh, to consider the influence of urban uh, uh, international development in urban studies. What's your view on this? Um, thank you. I, sh I should say my dogs have just decided to wake up and <laughs> that they would like me to play with them now. So I'm sorry if you hear any barking. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just think that, I think that the literature on South-South, and I'm, I'm talking about myself here, might have got a little bit too captured by the sort of development studies focus on what we call Big D development. Even though, and I don't, this is maybe a little bit harsh, I'm not saying that it isn't there, but when I'm reading the, say, urban literature the urban theorists they are so much more attentive to to the generative complexity dynamism things going on in uh you know a whole array of urban settings and of course it's not just africa or latin america it's now piraeus it's athens it's elsewhere um so i think that what's interesting is both of these fields and the underlying reality is very, very dynamic. So that world of big D development is changing fast, uh, particularly around finance. Uh, and the idea now that northern donors are really trying to drive private sector investment, PPPs and other things. So they are getting down into the kind of the, 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 the real capillaries of economies um, and so southern the scholars of particularly southern but all global development need to go, go there with them um, and I think that we all need to be looking more at business small and large formal and informal at the reality of um, urban planning with finance I mean so many of you I'm sure will know about the ultimately the failed project of Modafontaine just outside Johannesburg. So a big Chinese developer who, a private developer who nearly lifted off a huge, huge uh, project to, to build a vast kind of area just north of Johannesburg as a new district of the city. It didn't quite happen in the end. But what's interesting to me was that he was a private investor he, he wasn't primarily funded by the State Bank of China, one of the development banks. He, was, he went to the Bank of China and then other funding too. You know, and, and, and this, this, where the real energy, it seems to me, of the changing nature of South-South cooperation is, it, is in the private sector. It's in individuals. For better and for worse, uh, we need to be working more closely together, I think. I, I, I think there's a lot to uh, unpick um, as this, um, and maybe everyone, you feel like you're already on it and I'm being left behind, which I think might be true. Um, so I can, just, I can see a lot of uh, positivity from thinking through South-South cooperation as both um, everyday small d development, but recognizing the larger structures within which it's taking place, which is what I sort of study. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, response to yeah to emphasize the role of the private sector in this process. Thank you. And we have a question from uh, Andrea. So she's asking, I'm curious about how to government and politics enable and hinder South South cooperation. Yeah. Do you, do you mean on the like uh, as it were the recipient, the partner side? Andrea, can you clarify whether it's the recipient side of the government or like, you know, uh, the one providing side? I'm just thinking about how um, different, when different forms of government with different political ideologies, different mm -hmm. government stability in different countries, how does that like play a role in whether that cooperation happens? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if that's clear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so in the principles of South South cooperation, there's always a lot of respect for the partner government, that the partner government sets the priorities, decides, makes the, you know, has the leadership of the, the programme. 
because it, it, the idea is that this is not north-south development, which we know is often very hierarchical, very um, imperialistic. So south-south is meant to be more, egal you know, more um, respectful. Um, in practice, um, it's there's a big debate over the way in which partner governments have or have not been empowered by southern partnership. And I think most people would say that they have been to some extent. Uh, there's no question that Rwanda, the Paul Kagame could turn around and say, well, you want us to do this, but why should we? Because we can, you know, the we can get money from China, so we don't have to do what you tell us. But most, I think, um, partner countries are keen to keep the marketplace open. They don't want to exchange one development finance monopoly for another. So they've tended most countries to try to insist that that money from Brazil or Indonesia or Chile doesn't replace aid. Um, so then there are some you know questions about whether South South encourages and enables greater capacities, um, longer term structural transformation, more focus on um, what matters for that country. But there's also lots of um, concern and occasionally critique that say uh, it, it, it keeps powerful people in power, there's elite bargaining and, and so on. Sorry, it's a, it's a very rambling answer. It's a big, a big question. There's, there's a lot going on uh, for sure, um, but there's no question that for uh, the vast majority of countries around the world, this last 20 years, this, what the UN calls the rise of the South has really been both transformational, but sometimes you've, we've exchanged American and Canadian mining corporations for Chinese and Chilean ones. So the, 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 there is the, both the similarity and the change in some cases. Okay, so um, do you have any more questions? Uh, so uh, we have a question here. So we'll ask the uh, student to come here. So uh, just wait a second. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor Maudsley. Um, I guess I have a question on uh, maybe, so we do know that with South South Corporation, uh, at least from the way you sort of um, outlined it, that there's a sort of rise of the Southern state, uh, you know, diplomatically, economically sort of engaging with the world. But at the same time, um, you know, there's been a sort of drawing back of the state within Southern states. Um, you know, in sort of going from a developer of land um, or sort of regional planning into just a facilitator to kind of almost clear the field for, you know, flows of this private investment. So I was wondering whether, uh, you know, you, your work sort of engages with that or like maybe if you have some comments on how you see these two dynamics playing with each other. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's and and if right back at the start, I showed that change around financialization, state capital hybrids, PPP. So I think what's really interesting is the way in which there's, I think in many ways, Northern and Southern powers are converging around these new models of blurred and blended state capital. And that's very geoeconomically driven for both. So on the one hand, you see a sort of, uh, not exactly a retreat of the state in the Washington consensus way, but a new willing, a, a kind of a new forms and acceleration and energy around the idea of state capital hybridity. So the state de-risking private investment, the state um, uh, helping facilitate and create, uh, facilitate and manage blended finance, impact investing, and we, and we see that for all sorts of different sorts of state. So, um, I mean, I, I think everyone in the room probably knows more about what the implications are for sort of urban planning and development, but I, 
I was just looking to paper on, on the privatization of urban planning, for example. So if, if you're a, you know, I'm just plucking this out of the air. If you're Uganda and you're looking at this kind of increasing recourse to public private partnership and consultancies and private sector planning and so on, it, it may be the sort of so-called traditional planners of the UK or France, or it could be Korea or uh, Singapore or Dubai. So, so these new actors are able to, you know, are working and driving a, a world of, um, of uh, state capital hybridity. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. So we have another question for a student here. Let's hope you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? I can, I can. Okay, this, great. This is the problem. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so my question goes back to the conversation you had around the discursive frameworks, which I really appreciated. And I'm wondering um, how have those discursive frameworks been incorporated differently in the ways that um, governments accept the language that they use when they're accepting um, financing in the, the South South cooperation like framework um, has it do you see a, a difference in the in the way that that language is framework given the merging of the the discourse nowadays as opposed to when it was very clearly a, a Western discourse versus a South South um, discourse of how the aid the financing is, is provided. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it does. Yeah, so what's interesting is I don't really know in more urban examples or contexts. So, and this is this is what I'm interested about, this kind of like disconnect. Um, and yet, of course, this question in, in urban contexts is critical and probably one of the major uh, parts of the kind of, uh, you know, what's happening. And yet there's loads of stuff about agricultural development or trade more broadly, but there isn't specifically in relation to the urban. So um, there's lots of stuff around both different sorts of approaches to conditionality and environmental and social standards. Um, uh, again, quite a variety, um, but also, as I was mentioning, I think a suggestion that South-South cooperation is, is now getting a bit more concerned about things like the return on investment and things like that. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, sorry. Is that what you meant by framework? Yeah, no, I was just thinking in terms of when a government chooses to accept financing from another Southern government, is this, do they refer back to that discursive framework that it's being presented in, or is that left outside of the discussion? Is the discursive framework just important in how the, the gifting entity is uh, describing their work or does yeah. the receiving entity incorporate that same language um, as they're kind of promoting these different developments? Yeah, that's a really great, great question. So there's a paper by uh, Revoredo and Brill, which looks at uh, this Modafontaine. And although it wasn't a formal South-South cooperation project, it was full of the sort of this big mega project um sort of uh, grand scale chinese you know ambition and so on they argued that it very quickly just became ordinary urban planning uh just be, you know it, it very rapidly became whether you say it's bogged down or framed or experienced through everyday ordinary planning and and they argue that th there's too much sort of uh, valorization of the idea of Chinese this or Korean that, that really, in this case, it was just another investor who found what quite quickly became like all other investors. Um, I'm probably doing not doing the paper great justice, but that's their point. And I think, um, so there's very often reference to this being South South being different, more virtuous, better, more convivial, and I think actually many of those things are true, but what's clearly happened in both urban projects and others 
is that that language of shared experience, knowledge of each other, you know, conviviality is, is profoundly under, uh, you know, there's lots of friction around racism. So for example, I showed you that picture of the Cuban doctor, but the, the paper that I cite here, Lidola and Borges, says that many very, very poor people in Brazilian favelas did not want to be treated by a black doctor. They saw that as inferior, even though, as we know, Cuban doctors and healthcare workers are often extremely uh, well-trained and knowledgeable and so on. And there's lots of discussion around racial frictions um, and, and other plenty of other frictions in the system. So the re the, there's a sort of the, the discourse the reality and I think in the urban context really interesting questions about uh, at what point you're just another external actor it doesn't matter if you're Dubai or the Netherlands you're still in you know there's more that there's more in common than this discursive difference but I, 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 I suspect that that's I mean it's all out there there's so many different examples and um, ways of looking and it is absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience here or on Zoom? Okay, if not, uh, we'd like to thank you again, Professor Emma Mousy for the lecture and for the uh, conversation on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you.